Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you tonight. We bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. We just ask you to have your way tonight, Lord. Minister as only you can by the power of your spirit. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to you in every area, not only in this service, but in our lives. And, Lord, we just give you all the thanks and the praise for every good that can come from what you do in and through us. And for that, Lord, we are grateful and give you all praise and thanks. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Suzanne and the worship team. Appreciate that, Mike. All of you. Thank the Lord. It's been great having uh, Don and Darlene back again for a good portion of the summer. That was nice. Although we really didn't get to spend a whole lot of time together. So uh, the bigger the families get and the more all that stuff takes up time and space. And they've been busy dealing with real estate uh, and all that kind of stuff as well. But both of you guys, you know how much we appreciate you. And we're grateful that you were able to be back here and we got to spend a little bit of time with you. Amen. God bless you on your return trip to the, uh, well, let's make it a surprise, what do you say? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. No, they'll be going back to Arizona before too long. And, but uh, we appreciate them being here in Iowa and Darlene being one of the uh, original members of the church when we were out on the south side in a trailer park. And so it's great to have her and uh, Don with us again, praise the Lord. Appreciate her sharing with us Sunday and different times over the last month or two. And it's all good in Jesus, praise the Lord. So, hallelujah, have a safe trip back and everything will be good, praise the Lord. One of these cold winters, we'll come down and see you, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise God. All right, thank the Lord, amen. Appreciate all of you that are here tonight. Thank you for being here, and we'll get right into the Word of God because it is Wednesday night, and some people have to go back to another job tomorrow, praise the Lord. Personally, I just got to go to West Des Moines and deal with some other junk, but it's all good in Jesus, praise the Lord. So, if you have your Bible, uh, you can turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Roberto, and we'll read one verse there, and then we're going to go to John chapter 3, verse 17. We'll be moving right along, and these are not new scriptures to anybody, but I think it's, it's good that we, uh, we look at it. We're talking about, you know, mantles being laid out and all that, and I get it, but uh, Jesus is my mantle, praise the Lord. Trouble is, people do put that down. I mean, they do lay down their, their authority in Christ. So uh, we know that under the new covenant, there is but one mantle, one anointing, and that's Jesus, praise the Lord. He is the anointed, and it's his anointing that we all carry because we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. But we can be ignorant of that or just be indifferent and not operate in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and that's really what we're motivated to do. That's what the preaching of the Word is all about, to bring faith so that people will then operate in that faith Amen. and experience all of Jesus, Amen. that's available. So that this world can experience something besides miracles, they can actually experience the miracle himself, Jesus Christ. Praise Amen. the Lord. Sometimes the reason that happens is that people uh, believe the lie of the devil and sometimes even their own thoughts. And the enemy says that, or the scripture sa says that, G that the uh, devil is the accuser of the brethren. And uh, so he loves to run around and whisper ugly stuff about you in your ear. And uh, if you listen for very long, you'll begin to question, because we know ourselves pretty well and we know that we're in the natural imperfect. And because of that, we have a sense of uh, inadequacy and, uh, and uh, weakness because we feel like, well, God's not going to use me because I'm too screwed up or because I did this or because I thought that or because I made this mistake or didn't follow through on this thing or the other. Amen. So 
guilt, shame, condemnation will keep you from operating in the anointing and the power of God Almighty. Amen. Amen. He didn't. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. Uh, we're looking at blessed people right here. Praise the Lord. We're all blessed. Hallelujah. Because God does not impute sin to us as believers. And that means we are sinless. And because we are sinless, nothing is impossible with us. We have the same anointing, the same power, the same Father, amen, as Jesus. Hallelujah. And God loves us just the same as he does Jesus. Praise the Lord. So nothing is impossible if we can believe. Amen. All right? So Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I mentioned Sunday we were talking about this. The flesh is not just, you know, skin cells and dermis and so forth, but... The flesh is the sense realm. Yeah. Our flesh is our hearing, our seeing, our speaking, our touching, our feeling. That's the flesh. The flesh operates strictly by sense because that's the way this world operates. And our flesh is nothing but a, a body that gives us a legal right to operate in this world as spirits because we are spirit beings. The problem is when we forget that we are spirits, we have a tendency to digress or go back to the flesh to where we only believe what we see what we touch what we smell what we taste so we only believe what the doctor says we only believe what the lawyer says we only believe what the neighbor says or somebody else says instead of what God says because the word of God is quick and it's powerful it's alive it's the spirit amen of God it's spirit and it's truth hallelujah and if you look at it that way and operate uh, in that from that premise then you have authority and you have power if you go back to the flesh, immediately the enemy now has access to you. Because how does the enemy attack? Through the flesh, through the sense realm, through what you can see, what you can hear. So you see, oh, this isn't going to work out. This isn't happening. House fell through. Deal didn't work. Hey, God's got something far better. Amen. 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 You just haven't seen it yet. Praise the Lord. But he saw it. Amen. Before the foundation of the world. He had everything for you, Roberto and, and Kelly, uh, before you ever got put on this planet. He, he's invisible. He is eternal. And he's outside of time. But he gave you everything in Christ when you were born again. Everything you'll ever need, he already gave you. We're not trying to get God to do something. We just have to learn to receive what he's already done. All the things that you'll ever need in this life, he's already provided. Amen. Houses, cars, relationships, finances, health, healing, deliverance, it's all been taken care of. Lord. Amen. It's just a question of us being able to see into that invisible realm. You know, uh, we're talking about heaven, and heaven is not far away. There are different levels of heaven. We know that Paul went to the third heaven, which we could call the abode of God, but the truth is, Everything outside of this realm is heaven. The, the atmosphere is heaven. Heaven is just someplace we can't see. Praise the Lord. So if we operate in the power of the anointing, we can move from earth to heaven. We can move from this dimension to the dimension of heaven, the heavenly or the supernatural or the invisible realm. Amen. Which is all that it is. And we can receive what's there, what's already ours. In Jesus' name, and it can manifest. It can become a reality. Look, we were dead spirits. We were unborn again. We were not alive as far as God was concerned until we were born again. And immediately, we reached into the eternal, into the invisible, and received Christ. Praise the Lord. And we're alive in Christ forevermore. Amen. All right, John chapter 3, verse 17. So there is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God does not impute sin to us. We are born again. Hallelujah. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah. So if God didn't send Christ to condemn us in the first place when we were still sinners, amen, he certainly doesn't have an attitude of condemnation toward us now that we are blood-bought children of God. Amen. It just doesn't make sense, and yet religion has perpetuated this falsehood, amen, by trying to get people to, you know, get saved and then get saved again and again and again and keep repenting of everything that you do and don't do and think and so, and so forth so that people are always in this 
state of uh, kind of limbo, you know, between being everything that God wants you to be and what you used to be when you were just a rank sinner. That's not true. Once we were born again, we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That other stuff has gone away. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Hallelujah. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Praise the Lord. We are the children of God, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. Amen. We have all things, amen, whatsoever God has promised. They are ours, amen, if we will just receive it. Let's drop on down to verse 18 here, uh, Roberto, John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So on the one hand, he says he did not come into the world to condemn the world, amen, but he wants to save the world. But then he says he, those that don't believe on him, uh, uh, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but if you don't believe in him, you're condemned already. So is Jesus contradicting himself in the scripture? No way. Because the context here is this. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. Amen. If we backed up and went back to the first part of the scripture, he's speaking to Nicodemus, a religious Jew. Amen. He's even a part of the Sanhedrin. Amen. And he's speaking to him, this ruler of the Jews, and a teacher of the law of Moses. And he's telling him to believe on his name, believe on Jesus, amen, so that he won't perish, but so that he'll have everlasting life, right? Now, here's the thing, to believe not, right? That's what he says, those that believe not. To believe not is to choose instead to stay under the law of Moses, which would guarantee condemnation. Because nobody can keep the law outside of Christ. Right. Amen. So that's the context in which he's speaking here. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 now and verses uh, 6 through 11. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6 through 11. Because I guarantee you, no matter how long the Lord tarries and long, however long we are here living for Jesus and trying to fulfill the call of God on our life, healing, deliverance, prosperity, all the things uh, that... He wants for us and for us to then pass on to others. The devil is going to for sure always be around to whisper in your ear that you are the least. That you have no right to think that God's ever going to use you or that God's going to bless you supernaturally because you're too much of a derelict. You know, you, you're just too screwed up. And, uh, and he'll do that because we do stuff that is screwed up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But it's not accounted to us. Uh, his righteousness has been accounted to us. Our dysfunction was accounted to him. He paid for all of that so that we could walk in newness of life as though we were absolutely holy, righteous, and perfect because in the mind of God, we are. Hallelujah. It's just we that have the problem. Amen. So who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away? Now, you don't have to go back there, but verse 6, he's talking about, he has made us able ministers of the new covenant, the New Testament. Not of the letter, now he's referring to the old covenant, but of the Spirit of the letter. Right. I mean, what God was really trying to say through the law is what he's trying to get us to understand. Not the law itself, not the rules and the regulations, but what they represented. The righteousness, the holiness, the perfection of God. Amen. But of the spirit, for the letter kills. R read this thing sometimes outside of grace and it's a killer. It's depressing because you lose. There's no way you can do it. No way anybody can do it. And that's where the devil wants to get your head. But the Spirit gives life. When you read this by the Spirit, hallelujah, all of a sudden things begin to take on a whole new uh, reality. Praise the Lord. But if the ministration of death, the Old Covenant, written and engraved in stones, and like the Ten Commandments, was glorious, it was glorious because it had a purpose, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. 
how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be even greater, or rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. In other words, the glory of the new covenant is so much greater than the glory of the old covenant, it's almost as if there was no glory for it. Although there was, it's just so, so small in comparison. Amen? For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the law is the ministry of condemnation. And you can tell whenever anybody's in the law because they'll figure out a way to try to condemn you. Praise the Lord. They will. I promise you they will. They do it to me all the time. I don't care, but they do it anyhow. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter to me. Amen. I was under the actual condemnation long enough to know I'm not there anymore. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's good. Amen. That's good. But the word condemnation actually means judgment. It means like judgment against or a sentence passed upon. Punishment following. That's what you think of when you think of condemnation. Amen. There's judgment. There's going to be a sentence passed. And then there's going to be punishment as a result of whatever that sentence is. Amen. That's the concept, amen, of condemnation. So, paraphrasing uh, Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now, this minute, no, not one bit of judgment against you. No sentence passed on you or yours. No punishment following anyone who is in Christ. Praise the Lord. No judgment, no sentence. No punishment. Praise the Lord. No condemnation for any of us. Amen. Amen. However, here's what I like. There is a strong warning against anybody who tries to condemn those that God has justified. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Reminds me of that old talk of the ham, you know. <laughs> Look at Romans 8, 33 and 34. Romans 8, 33 and 34. I love this because somebody's always wanting to bring some kind of condemnation, especially to preachers. God knows we probably need it, but nevertheless, somebody's always looking for something that they can try to find something in the Scripture that they can put on you. Like, you know, man, you shouldn't have said that, or you shouldn't preach that, or you shouldn't preach this because you're not doing this, and so on and so forth. But here's what I... Here's what goes through my mind. I may not say it to them because I don't want to make them feel bad, but I'm thinking, let God make them feel bad. I'm not worried about it. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's us. That's you. That's me. Who? Who shall lay it? And that's, that's, not, that's a rhetorical question. He's not, he's, not, he's not expecting anybody to stand up and say, I will. <laughs> he's just saying, there's nobody can do this, right? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died. The only, in other words, the only one that had any right to condemn is the one that, that paid for this, and he's refusing to. Amen. He, it's Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So the only one that has any legal right to condemn us is up there praying for us, there making intercession for us. It's kind of hard to get him off of your side. You know what I mean? So God's justification of us and Christ's sacrifice and intercession for us meets not only the devil's judgment of us, but any man's judgment of us. Praise the Lord. And condemnation of us is all destroyed by these scriptures and others. Amen. And we are completely free from any guilt or any shame these scriptures completely destroy anyone's thought of condemning us because of their interpretation of a scripture or their ideas about the law or legalism or anything else. If I'm born again, I don't care what you think. It's just a thought. God has already declared the reality. 
Amen. The reality is there's no condemnation in Christ. I have none. If you've got something, don't bother sharing it. I don't care about it. I don't want it. I don't need it. It's all yours. You can have it all. Praise the Lord. These scriptures completely destroy any condemnation that the devil or anybody else, even you, might bring on yourself. Praise the Lord. Look at Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, 10 through 13. See, I love this because you don't have to get mad at anybody just because they want to condemn you, just because they want to pull out a scripture here or there and say, yeah, oh, well, you know. You. you just smile and go on, praise the Lord. Just say, they just don't know any better yet, praise the Lord. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing, as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Praise the Lord. That is written to you, to you personally. These are not just blanket statements. They're not just historic documents. This is God's voice to you personally. Praise the Lord. Look at Revelation now, 12. Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Praise the Lord. Now here's the point. The word of God teaches in no uncertain terms, Satan was defeated by Jesus, our Savior. And by what he did for us, right? Satan is defeated. He's just running around blowing his mouth with nothing to back it up. He's writing checks with his mouth that his butt cannot cash. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's a fact. He's all bluff. He's all get you into the sense realm where he can mess with your thinking and, and scare you and get you all paranoid Amen. Because that's the only tool he's got is fear. The only, the only weapon he has is accusation and fear. And God's already told us. He's not listening. Jesus is ever making intercession. So every time the enemy says, got you, Jesus said, nope, they're innocent. Innocent. Declared innocent. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15. Hebrews 2 verses 14 and 15. This, this is the truth that sets you free. If we really believe this, if we get to the place where this is so ingrained in us and so much a, a reality to us, you'll get up every morning with a smile on your face. You'll go to bed every night with one on your face. You won't be depressed. You won't be bummed out. You won't be freaked out. What have you got to fear? If God is for you, who can be against you? If God is on our side and, and, and every time the enemy comes and tries to put something against us, or some other human comes and tries to put something against us, or our own mind does, God says they're innocent, they're perfect, they're pure, they're spotless, they're just like me. Amen. Praise the Lord. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy them that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. 1 John 3 and 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Praise God. How many of you know we are no longer under the law? Because we're not under the law... There is no law. Therefore, you cannot break the law 
because it doesn't exist. Amen. It was fulfilled in Christ. Amen. So the devil tries to tell you, just like he's saying here, commit sin is of the devil. How You can't commit sin. That's a surprise, wasn't it? You can't commit sin because there is no law for you. You are innocent. You go back to Adam and Eve. It wasn't that Adam and Eve didn't do some stuff that under the law would have been sin. But they were innocent because there was no law. The only law was don't eat from that one tree. That's the only law they broke because it's the only law there was. Okay? Well, then for centuries or for millennia, or at least 14, 1,500 years, whatever it was, the law is in effect, and you break the law, you sin. Jesus comes and fulfills the law so that now there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. We're operating in the Spirit of the New Covenant, no law. So you don't sin. Somebody that commits sin is of the devil. Why? Because he's not under the new covenant. Otherwise, he couldn't sin. By definition, if a person sins, biblically speaking, he has to be outside of Christ. Say amen. Praise the Lord. Because this is part of the good news. Amen. This, for That's the purpose. That's the reason that the Son of God was manifested. Why? To fulfill the law so we wouldn't be sinners anymore. We'd be saved by grace. Amen. Amen. God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? Condemnation and guilt and shame because of accusations of us breaking the law. When Jesus fulfilled the law, he took away the only weapon the devil had, the law. It's the only thing he could use because that by the law, he could say, you didn't keep that one. You broke that one. You're going to bust hell wide open. He took away the one thing that he had to use against us. He's got to get you back in the flesh, back under the law in order to accuse you of anything. But you can't sin because there is no law for you. Praise God. This is getting better all the time. All right, look at, the, look at this. James chapter 4 and verse 2, I think. James 4 and 2. No, verse 7. Verse 7. Yeah, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God... Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Okay, how do you do that? Right here. You submit yourself to the word of God and not your flesh. Submit yourself to the word of God. That's how you resist the devil, and he'll leave. Once he knows he can't get you in the flesh, he's got no way of defeating you, so he'll go away. He'll, I'm not saying he won't ever come back. I'm just saying he'll leave you at least for a season. Because the only power he's got over you is to get you into fear and condemnation. If you stand on the word of God, he has no weapon to use against you. So today, all we have to do is submit to God, or literally submit to his word of righteousness. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Submit to the word of righteousness, which is the gospel, basically. Amen. And the devil has no tool against you. He has no weapon. Resist Satan's influence with the word. And... He will flee from you. Praise the Lord. In 1 Peter, in fact, let's go there. 1 Peter 5 and 8. 1 Peter 5, uh, 8 through 10. Now, this is interesting, too, because it it, it just gives you a little more context. Sometimes we read the Bible, we just have a tendency to kind of just read through it and hope it makes sense according to something else. But watch this. Now, be sober, be vigilant. As your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resists steadfast in the faith. Now watch it, that, because that's the key word to this whole uh, the context of these three verses here. And whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in the, your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that we have 
after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That suffering is not, you know, being crucified and stuff. We've talked about this a lot of different times, but that suffering is just living in this world. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So you can do that through faith in the word of God. But here he says, resist the devil steadfast in the faith. And that's the key. Amen. So resist Satan steadfast in the faith. And whenever the phrase the faith is used in the Bible, he's referring to what Jesus did for us. Amen. That's the faith that we have to hold on to. Amen. What Jesus did for us. Amen. Being made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the faith that he speaks of. And it is, it is the context of every time that's used. Okay, so that's the faith. The faith is I am the righteousness of God in Christ because Jesus took all my sins. Amen. He paid the price Amen. so that I could be righteous. That is the faith. All right, Satan's accusations just fall flat. Whenever we boldly declare, I am the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ, in the blood of Jesus, he has no argument now. Right. He's totally disarmed. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. He can't say, oh, but I heard you say that word, or I saw you do that thing. I don't care what you saw. I don't care what you heard. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Not because of what I haven't said, not because of what I haven't done but because of what Jesus did. Right. You cannot use my own behavior against me anymore. Sorry. <laughs> I am the righteousness of God in Christ. There's no law to judge me by, but the law of righteousness the or the law of sin and death. Praise the Lord that Jesus fulfilled. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. Romans chapter 3. Uh, verse 24 through 26. Romans 3, 24 through 26. Being justified freely by the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Praise the Lord. So even if you condemn yourself, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 uh, through 22. 1 John 3, 20 through 22. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God, which is what I've been talking about for this whole message. If your heart condemns you, you have a tendency to feel inadequate and unable to do the things that God has called you to do and, and not empowered and so on and so forth. But he says, even if your heart condemns you, God is greater than our heart. If your heart doesn't condemn you, you've got confidence towards God, that God will do everything and anything that he's ever said he would do, right? And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. How do we keep his commandments? We focus on the faith of Jesus Christ, who kept all of the commandments. Amen? And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. What is pleasing in his sight? That we believe that he finished this work. That he did everything he said he was going to do. It is finished. Praise the Lord. Whatsoever. Praise the Lord. If our hearts condemn us greater than our hearts know us, if the heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. And, we, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. How many of you got some whatsoevers? Uh, Amen. Amen. You ought to have confidence that whatsoever you ask, he's, he's going to do it. Praise the Lord. In fact, he wants to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. There are some whatsoevers we haven't even dreamed up yet. But he wants to do anyhow. 
if we could have exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Anything you could imagine, he's got something greater planned. He's just asking us to step up to the next level of faith, to believe for even bigger and better things. Amen? Amen. See, without condemnation, we have confidence toward God for anything, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's uh, spiritual, whether it's gifts, operating in the gifts, any of that stuff. It all comes to us because we have confidence in God. Why do we have confidence in God? Because we have no condemnation. We feel perfectly accepted in the blood. God looks at me and says, that's my kid. I just want to spoil it rotten. <laughs> and I'm all for that. I want to be God's brat. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I got a witness. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, you can't help yourself. It's the same spirit, right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Woo! I just felt that. Hallelujah. I have God's breath. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Praise the Lord. I do act up every once in a while, but he never, never punishes me. <laughs> he says, that's my boy. That's my boy. Praise the Lord. That's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Praise God. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire. Praise the Lord. See what, what confidence can do. Not confidence in me, confidence in the finished work. Praise the Lord. Confidence in God because I have no condemnation. Whatever I ask, as long as it's in his will, I know that he wants to, I know that he hears me. And if he hears me, I'm that spoiled brat of his, he's going to do it for me. Praise the Lord. That's where we've got to get to. We've got to get to the place where we are so sure of God's love for us and his mercy towards us and his desire to spoil us rotten that even when I act up, he can't help himself. Isn't that sweet? You know how you do with the, you know, the grandkid. It was somebody else. You think, what? Does, has anybody taught that kid anything? You know, but when it's yours, you go, oh, that is so sweet. That's God. Amen. He's got, he's got some of my stuff on his refrigerator. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, he does. Praise God. According to his will. Praise God. According to his will. Think about it now. A will is a living, legal document. According to his living, legal document, which is describing everything that he has bequeathed, his goods, amen, his properties, his prosperity, he hears me. Praise God. And knowing that he hears me, whatsoever I ask, I know that I have it. I'm not going to have it. I do have it. Praise the Lord. The petitions, that's plural, unlimited. Whatever I desire of him, he says, you got it. Not you're going to get it. You got it. Praise God. So here's what I'm saying. Listen, to, Just listen to me for a minute. Sin isn't blocking blessings from you. Praise the Lord. Romans 4 and 8. Your failures in the natural are not blocking God's blessings, his supernatural blessings from you. That's a lie of the devil. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You are already blessed. You're not trying to get blessed. You're not trying to get a blessing. You have been blessed. You are blessed of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're not... <laughs> We're not blessed because we never sin. We're blessed because God does not impute sin to us. Praise God. The truth is, lack of revelation is what blocks blessings. 
not knowing God, not knowing his word, not knowing how he really sees us and feels about us, that's what blocks the blessing. Why? Because I have condemnation. And because I have condemnation, I have no confidence in God. That's this Bible, especially the New Covenant, but the whole Bible really, if you understand it in the context in which God wrote it, is a personal word from God to you, and it's all about building up your confidence so you can receive everything that God wants you to have. Amen. Praise God. We'll, we'll end with this. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. You know, it's, it's like what you do, you know, I don't know about you guys, but kids, grandkids, whatever. If you've got one that's kind of a little imp, you know, I mean, just kind of, you go out of your way to say positive stuff to them, right? Well, I do. And the reason is because I know why they're acting like the imp, because they want attention. Right. Now, they don't want negative attention, but they just want attention, and any attention is better than no attention. Right. Exactly. So they act up. Well, when you say, boy, that was really good job, you know, you ate all your baloney, whatever, you know, you, you, thank you so much for, you know, picking up that glass after you dumped it on the floor. That was really good of you. You're really doing good. What are you doing? You're, you're making the kid feel accepted, making them feel loved. You're giving them confidence. Praise the Lord. If there's one thing you need in life, not just in Christianity, but in life, you've got to have some confidence. Right. The world's out here to just slap you down and make you feel inferior and worthless and so on and so forth. Without confidence, it's hard to do much of anything. That's why God spends all of this energy, all of this time, all of this word, what? Building up our confidence. Yes. Not so that we're arrogant jerks, but just so that we feel like nothing is impossible for us. God can do anything through me. Why? Because he loves me. Yes. He's invested in me. Yes. He's told me I'm perfect. I'm righteous. I'm everything. Hey, moreover, so, moreover, the law entered so that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded... Grace did much more abound. That's child psychology 101. The more they act up, the more you love them. Right? Why? Because wherever the law is, wherever there's a don't do, they're going to do it. Can I get a witness? Praise the Lord. Why? Because the only law Adam and Eve had was the one they broke. Tell them. Don't walk on the grass. Somebody is going to walk. They're not going to only walk. They're going to drive their vehicle on there. They're going to spin their tires. They're going to dig a hole. They're going to hunt moles. They're going to do all kinds of stuff because there's a sign that says don't do it. Right. Kids are the same way. Don't slam that bang door <laughs> thousand times, you know. And, you know, with the grandkids, it's same. I, I, if I say it once, I say it a hundred times. You know, don't do that anymore. Don't. Hit your brother. Don't hit. You know, don't do that. The more you say it, the more they do it. And in fact, they'll get to where, this is one man, I'll say, Bubba, get off the side of the pool. He'll look right at me and then hang over the edge of the pool. Do you hear me? And he'll give you that grin like, yeah, I heard you, so what? What are you going to do? You're over there on the deck. I'm clear out here. You'll have to walk out here in the sun. I'll make, I'll make it uncomfortable for you. You understand what I'm saying? You say, kids, we're all kids. We're all God's kids. Yeah. And the moment you, I mean, hey, the speed limit is 35. <laughs> I, like, I mean, I think that means I can drive 38, right? It's 65, I can drive 68. They won't stop me if it's only three or four miles over. It's, you're breaking the law. It's three miles, but you're breaking the law. I remember a guy telling me one time, you know, well, the Bible doesn't say you can't drink. It just says don't get drunk. I said, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, he said, how many drinks does it take you to get drunk? I said, it depends on what I'm drinking. Well, we'll say scotch. Three. Well, it depends on if I'm drinking doubles or something. No, I'm you know what I'm saying. Okay, so just say three. He said, well, then if you drink one drink, you're a third drunk. That's the law talking, church. You understand what I'm saying? You, you, you know what I mean? So God's giving us a principle. He's giving us a truth, and we're trying to make it a law. Amen? 
Praise God. I don't know what that was about, except I may stop and get a drink on the way home. <laughs> Just kidding. Just in case. You never know what will come over you on the way home. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. See, I'm telling you, God's got a sense of humor, or this place would be burnt to the ground. <laughs> Hallelujah. If we believed, if we believed what some people say, I wouldn't finish the words, and we'd just see a bright light, and that'd be it. The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. Praise the Lord. He gave us the most valuable possession he had in life. And that life is everything. We're not just talking about sucking air and a heartbeat. We're talking about everything that life really is. And he gave that for us. So how stupid would it be to think that by doing that, he's done? What he's saying is, by giving us that, how shall he not? He can't. See, he can't stop. How shall he not give us all things? Because all of our things were in Christ on that cross. Praise the Lord. And now, all of the kingdom of God, all of our goods, all of our inheritance are in him. And we are in him, and he is in us. Amen. So we have it if we believe it. Amen. And the less condemnation, the more confidence. The more confidence, the more goods, Amen. the more blessings. Hallelujah. Thank you. God loves us to feel free in him. Amen. Amen. He gave us the truth so that we could be free, so that we could live our lives not looking over our shoulder, but always looking forward to the next thing God has for us. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning or this evening. Praise God. <laughs> amen, amen. He's a good God. I mean, he is more than a good God. That has just seems so superfluous, but he is the great I am, amen. the only true and living God. Amen. He is love yes. and the personification of it. He's all for us. Praise the Lord. So who can be against us? Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week. Walk like you are somebody. Praise the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.